In this video, we're going to talk about inference of one mean. And before we do that, we want to talk about something called the student t distribution. And so the idea is with the one mean inference that we're going to do, um, the central limit theorem is not always going to apply. In other words, our sample size is not always going to be at least 30. Um, and so the t distribution allows us to attain multipliers corresponding to the desired level of confidence when the sample size is uh, too small. And so here's the idea is if we have the central limit theorem, in other words, n is large, then we're going to get a nice normal distribution picture. But if n is small, what that means is we're gonna have more error. So instead of most of our area being concentrated in the middle, we're going to have some thicker tails if we have a small sample size. Um, and so if we see here, that's exactly what ends up happening. Um, here's a picture with the standard normal. Uh, we have t with in, uh, 9 degrees of freedom and 2 degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is a value that is dependent on the sample size. And so it says here t distributions have more area in the tails than the standard normal distribution. Um, and so as an interesting piece of trivia, the t distribution was developed when uh, William Gossett was working at the Guinness Brewery in Dublin um, because he was doing some statistical inference uh, involving the beer. All right, so now that we know that we're going to be using a different distribution this time, um, the basic concepts of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests are going to remain the same. We're just going to calculate them with a different distribution. So with confidence intervals, our point estimate, remember the idea is that we're inferring the mean of the population. So instead of thinking about proportions, we're going to be thinking about means this time. So our point estimate is going to be the sample mean x bar. The standard error is when the central limit theorem is used and we know the standard deviation, it's sigma over root n. But remember this time we're not going to know anything about the population. So we're going to estimate it using the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And then the multiplier is going to be this number t star, which is equal to the inverse t function of 1 minus alpha over 2. Again, alpha is the error. And then a second parameter called the degrees of freedom. Um, so df is degrees of freedom. And it is going to be equal to n minus 1. Then our confidence interval is x bar minus t star times the standard error up to x bar plus t star times the standard error. Uh, the influences on the width of the confidence interval are the same as before. Um, as the confidence level goes up, so does the width. As the sample size and therefore the degrees of freedom go up the width goes down, our estimate gets better. When we're hypothesis testing for one mean, um, again, the concepts are the same, it's just that the tools become different. Our null hypothesis is that the true mean is equal to some value mu naught. Our alternative hypothesis is going to be that the true mean is either greater than, less than, or not equal to that value. We have a test statistic, which we now call TC, because we're using a different distribution. TC is equal to x bar minus mu naught divided by the standard error. And the good news is the standard error is the same as it is in both the confidence intervals and the hypothesis testing approach. Um, the reason it's different for proportions is because the standard error is dependent on the value of the proportion. Um, since the standard error for means is not dependent on the value of the mean, uh, we don't have to worry about that being different in confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Uh, the p-value is now calculated using the tcdf function. All right, so let's get some practice using um, the t distribution. So if you have a ti83 calculator, uh, it's not going to have an inverse t function. So you're going to be given a table that's on the next page of the notes packet, and you can search that table to figure out what your multiplier should be.
So for example, if we want to have a 95% confidence interval with n equal to 15, that means that our degrees of freedom is equal to 14. So if we look at the table, we find in the table 14 degrees of freedom. Here it is. And then I want to find the number corresponding to 95% probability, which is going to be this number right here. So T star is equal to 2.145. 99% confidence with n equal to 50, so that means that the degrees of freedom is going to be equal to 49. So this time let's use the calculator. We do inverse t of, we want uh, 1 minus alpha over 2, so that's going to be 0.995. We want to include that 0.5% uh, of underestimate. And then our degrees of freedom is 49. And doing that in the calculator gives us 2.68. Uh, then we want to do 90% confidence with n equals 35. Um, so with n equals 35, we're going to run into the issue that there are, are not, it's not a row for 30 d f equals 34 on our table. So when d f is between two rows on the table, we're always going to go with the smaller or more conservative estimate. So let's look at our table here. Let's find n equals 30, or d f equals 30. There it is right there. We want to take the smaller, more conservative estimate. And then at 90% confidence, that's going to be our second column. So that's 1.697. I want to point out to you that as n and df increase, the difference between the values in each row gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And in fact, when you get to quote unquote df equals infinity, this just means really high df. These are the normal CDF values. So there's some sort of limiting process here as uh, n tends to infinity, um, the t distribution works more like the normal distribution. All right, so when df was 34, our value was 1.697. So that's how we find the multiplier using either the inverse t function or the table. Uh, now we want to use the TCDF function to figure out what our p-values would be in a hypothesis test. So in this first case, we have the alternative hypothesis is mu less than 100. Our test statistic is negative 2.4, and our n is 20, meaning that our df is 19. So we'd use the TCDF, and since my alternative hypothesis is lower than the claimed value, I'm going to go from negative 9999 up to negative 2.4 with a df of 19, and that gives me 0 0.0134. So in that case, I would have evidence for the alternative hypothesis. In the second example here, we want to claim that mu is greater than 100, but our test statistic is negative. So what that means is that our sample mean was less than 100, which means it's not going to give us very much evidence for the alternative. So tcdf here, uh, since mu is supposed to be greater than 100, we go from negative 1.2 to 9999, comma 22, which is the degrees of freedom from that 23, and we get 0.8785. So that's very, very little evidence uh, for the alternative hypothesis. Then in the third example, we have mu not equal to 100 and a test statistic of 2.9. So since this is a two-tailed hypothesis test, I'm going to double the TCDF from 2.9 to 9999. I could also do negative 9999 to negative 2.9 uh, with a DF of 29, and that is equal to 0 0.007.